Afterwards, 400 boys filled the station. It was not far from the camp, so there were no signs of civilization. Even the locomotive drivers were from the Secret Service. Everything around looked peaceful. The atmosphere was tranquil. Only the occasional shouts of gatekeepers from other camps in the area and machine gun bursts broke the silence. It was an attempt to shoot down an airplane, its hum resembling a bee buzzing over a flowering field. The train arrived. The train was disconnected to be towed to the alternate track. There was no timetable here. Military police regulated the movement of trains in one direction or another within the classified area, and when we were given the go-ahead, our train moved on to Pilar. The small town, with a population of half a million, was not far from the South Stay Block. We had an excellent harbour in front of us. We landed just off the shore at a guarded gate, and as we entered we found ourselves in a beautiful garden. A little farther in the bushes, we noticed green painted barracks, with windows painted white. It reminded me of a fairy tale. I heard a voice coming from the loudspeaker. To the commander of the 115th Prussian Naval Unit, report to the Yurtu. I jumped up on the spot and rushed to the headquarters located at the station, where a whole group of naval officers were stationed. They looked at me with contempt, almost turning their noses up at me, showing by their whole appearance how much superior they were to the boy in the captain's uniform who stood before them. All of them, I realised a moment later, were active naval officers and were now our new instructors in the group. They knew nothing about Unit 115 except its name and number, all they needed to know. Unit by unit, we went into the barracks following our instructors. These were our new barracks. There were also two mess halls, one for the volunteers and one for the officers. Compared to our previous school, some things had changed here. One of the officers said that there was a new rule in the group and now both officers and soldiers would eat together. For a few days we were left to ourselves and then the training began. First we practiced scuba diving by diving underwater. From the outside, the place looked like a huge silo. On the surface it was 30 metres square, but underwater it was a little more, about 40 metres. One instructor controlled our actions from the outside. The other underwater was our safety net. We dived in loose groups of about 50 people, while the others watched from the outside and the instructor commented on our actions, pointing out mistakes and correcting us. Immediately at the end of the first training day, our entire group was sent for a medical checkup, where the first thing we did was to have our blood pressure measured while the next group started diving training. The main purpose of the training was to learn how to behave properly underwater, and a separate squad was formed, where the main thing in the process was an intensive method of training in underwater subversion. The men who were to carry out subversion work in Russia were selected for this unit, and I, as commander of the unit, was naturally obliged to start training. At the same time, every day, while most of the battalion was working on the water, the two squads took turns in tank gunnery drills in a closed area. There were also Russian-made machine guns, which had to be assembled and dismantled, cleaned, and, of course, fired. The next day, the new two squads took the place of the previous ones, and those, in turn, returned to the underwater exercises. Here our day was scheduled by hours, and not a day passed that in the middle of the night a sharp knock suddenly did not make someone jump up. As soon as the study of one subject came to an end, we began to study the next, and so on until each of us learned every detail, from behaviour in underwater conditions to pressure drops. We memorised the rules until it was as obvious to us as the fact that the earth is round. After finishing our training in the makeshift pool, we began our drills at sea. Each morning, wearing suits that made us look like frogs, with air cylinders strapped to our backs, we boarded the barges waiting for us and set off about five kilometres from shore. There was not more than half an hour's worth of air in the cylinders, and the rest of the lesson was spent cleaning the hoses from the cylinders and other underwater equipment. We learned to conserve every breath of precious air and make the most of every breath. Anyone who used up air too quickly, or used it before reaching land, was considered a failure. So again and again, day after day, we honed our skills until we were perfect at it. Of course, this applied to all of us. The diving course was much easier than our previous training. Sometimes there were curiosities, but in general the whole process was something new and exciting for everyone, and even if there were any problems we were happy to deal with them. After a few weeks our instructors announced to us that we now had diving skills as good as any diver in German navigation and were ready for our first manoeuvres, which would take place somewhere on the north coast in real combat conditions. The next day two old transport ships arrived behind us. 
they were almost rusted through, and in such poor condition that there was no doubt they were incapable of serving any purpose except to ferry us to our destination. Before coming on board, we were equipped with everything we need. Oil to lubricate the machinery, weapons, grenades, and finally a report of our arrival. Once out on the open sea, the ships changed course frequently throughout the day, thus confusing us completely, so that we were unable to determine in which direction we were heading. For some of the boys it was their first time at sea. Naturally they found it difficult to navigate and were worried. Although we had compasses it was still impossible to determine which way was land. It was all just another test where we were required to prove what we had really learned over the years. I remember that morning very clearly. A military alarm was sounded for all units along the coast, announcing that British ships and submarines were attempting to silently enter the territory. Orders were given to fire on any vessel without warning, and to my surprise I felt absolutely calm and confident. Perhaps I had an advantage over the others as I was not new to the sea and knew the area as well as the backyard of our house. I had sailed these waters for a year and then another year with my brother and knew just about every sandy beach and sea topography. But at the same time, I didn't want to share my knowledge with anyone, perhaps because the instructors were trying to confuse us. Their futile efforts to mislead us only made me feel better. Willie's face was full of confusion. Jorg, I'm getting dizzy with these constant changes, of course. It's useless to keep track of the ship. It's not clear which way is the shore. We'll get lost in these manoeuvres. I smirk. Willie, I know this sea like the back of my hand, so quit worrying. But it's dark now. How do you know where we are? He shouted. Remember I told you about my boat and how I spent more time on the sea than at home? Well, it's half past two in the morning, and all the towns are darkened. There are no lights anywhere because there are air raids. I mean, I can't know where we are. But I'll tell you, Willie. We're going back to Pillow. And if our ship doesn't change the course she's on now, in six miles we'll come ashore at the north end of the town, where the munitions factory is, and I think we'll be given a mission to destroy it, or at least to get in undetected. Mm hmm. How do you know that? He whistled. Shut up, I snapped at him. Anyone can hear us. You know our covert activity is to destroy our munition factories, field depots and fuel supplies? Of course these are just maneuvers and we won't actually destroy any, but we have to practice on something. The only ammunition factory I know of is just around here, and that's the only place we can go. You're right, he said. If you think about it, that's the way it is. But how do you know we're on the right course? Hmm. Ten minutes ago we passed the New Harbour Lighthouse and the ships changed course. But not much. I don't think more than five to ten degrees. So we must be about eight kilometres offshore now. Let's hope you're right, he replied. Fifteen minutes later the engines were shut off. The anchor was dropped, and the captain called me into his cabin. Now we are six kilometres south of Pileo, he told me, and I will have an instruction. You go to the ammunition factory located in the north of the city. I wish you good luck. We exchanged handshakes, and I went to the rest of the guys, trying hard to hold back a smile. They had been so diligent in preparing their tricks, trying to confuse us, that now I had to play surprise. When I joined the rest of the guys, most of them were already dressed in frog suits and their uniforms and weapons were in waterproof bags. I changed quickly and as the dive rigs were lowered into the water, several men silently approached us. Well done, boys, shouted one sarcastically. Now it's time to act on your own, but don't think it's going to be easy because it's not. Both vessels raised their anchors and in five minutes we were left completely alone in the Black Sea, among wind-driven small but still waves. I swam quickly up to the rig where the squad was waiting. The basic rule I'd been taught throughout my training was to trust no one, so I didn't bring a plan with me. That way no one here would know what I was going to do. Very briefly I explained the situation to the guy. We are four or five kilometres from the coast, and if we count roughly six kilometres from the peninsula near which the harbour in Pillow is located, since they have tried to fool us by saying that we are south of Pillow, and therefore on the other side of the harbour, I think we should play along with them. So we will now move along the peninsula and come ashore at a distance of three kilometres west of here. The whole coast here is sandy. There are a few trees, but the forest starts right next to the sea. There are bunkers where anti-personnel mines are placed. The patrols on the beach are constantly on guard. They probably have dogs, so be extremely careful not to make the slightest sound. 
There was a look of amazement on the boys' faces. They were eager to know how I knew all this. Logic, I answered, plus knowledge of the beaches here. Since this is the most convenient place for the enemy to land, we're likely to be expected here, so we have to be ready for anything. Their guards aren't dormant. One by one, the entire squad moved slowly northwest, at about a 45-degree angle to the shoreline. When the shore was about 400 meters away, I gave the boys one last command. Willie and I will go first. The rest of us will wait here until we give the signal, if anything goes wrong. You can anticipate the situation and fool the patrol, swim another kilometer east and land there. Taking two bottles with us, Willie and I headed toward the shore. I was worried whether everyone would do as we had been taught, save the air in the bottles and not get confused underwater. It could happen that a person would pass out for five minutes, and when they came back to consciousness, they couldn't tell if they were asleep or actually unconscious. I was angry with myself when these thoughts came into my head, in which case there was little hope of passing unnoticed. One might as well crawl on the sand, swimming under water meter by meter. We surfaced and, just in front of us, saw a minefield fenced with barbed wire stretched between concrete pillars. But luck favoured us, since it was high tide we could sail over them. We stopped close to the shore. Two sentries were on duty and sauntered along the beach for a distance of about 500 metres, just now heading in the opposite direction from us. Without wasting a second, we changed our clothes. Me into my captain's uniform and Willie into his senior lieutenant's uniform. We had barely had time to bury our underwater equipment in the sand when they reached the opposite edge and turned around and spotted us. One of them shouted, The sun is coming up, and hurried toward us. This was the password, and I answered, It's hot, and was surprised that it worked. The patrolman looked perfectly calm, but still ordered us to raise and show our hands. When a suitable situation for conversation had developed, I pronounced, Hmm. Captain, 115th Prussian Naval Unit, and Willie followed me by introducing himself as a senior lieutenant. After saluting, they asked no further questions, probably because they saw the skull on our epaulettes. I thanked them for their attentiveness at the post, and said that Germany should have as many such soldiers as possible. But still, they could not finally rid themselves of their suspicions, and one of them asked, Gentlemen, how did you cross the minefield? A minefield. I had not considered this, but the answer immediately came to my mind. The most important thing was to answer without showing my confusion. We were taught to recognize mines by smell. Hmm, I answered briefly. So you don't have to know where they are. The older guard grinned. Good joke, he replied with satisfaction. The night was cold, too cold, and I had to strain my body to keep from shivering. I couldn't see what Willie was doing, but suddenly he said slyly and loudly, I'm afraid it's a long way to our destination. I'm afraid we'll be freezing to death. With your permission, Captain, I'd like a sip from the bottle of scalding liquor. Knowing what would follow, I answered immediately. Hey, after we crossed the minefield, I wouldn't mind a sip or two either. The sentries went with us. The older one was in the lead, followed by the younger one, and we followed them. This trail is wide enough, said the younger one. Two small stakes on either side serve as boundary markers on the trail. They are about 30 centimetres above the ground. We know what they are for, but no one else knows anything about it. We know it too, because it's our job to know about it. By then we were walking through a minefield. When we made a halt, I asked Willie for a glass, and he politely poured me some schnapps from an uncorked bottle. Before drinking, I said to the guards, The nights are cold and dank, and this improves the circulation. Then I asked carelessly, Where is your command post? They listened attentively to the question, and the eldest stretched out his hand, pointing in the direction. There, at the edge of the forest. Four kilometers west of here. Would you like us to escort you? No, that won't be necessary. While we were talking, Willie filled a glass, but from a different bottle. He offered it to our escorts, but being Germans and strictly disciplined, they refused. So I told them, everything will be all right. The night is so cold and those who serve the fatherland have the right to take a sip of this precious drink for our common cause. The younger guard took the glass, drained it, and handed it to another. Willie poured again, and the second one drank in a volley as well. Watching them a little anxiously, we continued our conversation, waiting for the contents of the bottle to do its work. 
In five minutes the result was already evident. I thought we had killed them, because they collapsed to the ground where they had been standing. I lit a cigarette, because it was the safest signal I could give at that moment. Lighting a torch was too dangerous, as it could be spotted by a patrol, but a flare from a match could only mean that one of the guards had decided to smoke. Indeed, four hundred people, having seen the signal, landed on the beach. While I stood by the guards, Willie went back to the beach to meet the boys. Without wasting a moment, he led them, still in their diving suits, through the mined area, but as they entered the forest, they split off in different directions to surround the command post. As it turned out, we needn't have worried too much. The destination was a seven-minute walk away, and the patrolmen were unconscious for another ten minutes. When they woke up, they grabbed their rifles, jumped up, and their amazement was unparalleled when they realized they were unconscious. By then, the 115th had gone far into the woods, and everyone had had time to change into their uniforms, fold up their scuba gear, and hide it so that they could find it again later. As the guards rose to their feet, finally coming to their senses, I heard a whole squad marching toward the command post, singing soldier songs as if they were on their own turf. Lieutenant Fuse approached us and report. All squads are assembled. Then he winked at me, letting me know that our men had already infiltrated the command post and that everything was going according to plan. Both sentries and officers were completely unaware that our squad had come ashore, and the only thing they could think of was that we were just another group of cadets doing exercises in these parts. Chiz went with me to the post. All the guys lined up right in front of the front door, and I thought with a chuckle, that's Willie's job. A couple officers were looking out the windows, lazily watching as Willie gave the command to close ranks. I wondered very much what they would think if they found out who we really were. Stretching the time, Willie took his time going around the formation, and only after he was sure everyone was oriented to the terrain did he give the command march. Chanting songs, we marched triumphantly toward the ammunition plant. An hour later we reached the site. Entering the factory yard, we sang even louder. Commanders, officers, all stood and looked at us with their mouths wide open. We managed to fool even our instructors. They expected us to sneak around and eventually fall into the trap anyway but it turned out that we fooled the whole coast when it should have been the other way around. We proved our absolute readiness and that no one and nothing can stop us, no matter how seriously guarded a particular object is. As we learned later, it was the biggest shock they had ever experienced and many higher ranking officers had been tried for lack of ingenuity and foresight. The trucks were waiting for us, our underwater equipment had been packed and now we were off to a well-deserved rest. Every last one of us felt exhausted and, on reaching our beds, fell unconscious. No one disturbed us, and it was about eleven o'clock when I awoke the next morning to a warm and respectful touch on my shoulder. There is a telegram for you from Admiral Canaris, I heard a voice say. I jumped out of bed, washed, dressed, cleaned my uniform, rubbed the stars on my epaulettes and rushed to the headquarters. The stern, smiling faces of the senior officers looked at me unfriendly. They all sat at a large round table, and I saluted with confidence, as an old school officer. Then I took off my cap, and the sergeant, in one motion intercepting it, hung it on a hook. The senior officer, a brigadier general, pointed to a chair, and I sat down proudly. You've caused me a hell of a lot of trouble, he said in an iron tone. Now my officers have to answer for everything. I understand you knew perfectly well you had a mission to accomplish, and the officers at the command post were informed of your mass landing. But like snakes that can't be seen in the grass, you crawled out from under the water and fooled everyone. In his gaze you could feel dislike and even hatred. My stupid officers are watching the territory, not letting anything out of their sight, but you've outsmarted them too, breaking all the rules. To march and sing formation as if it were a regular drill team is ridiculous. I listened to him but could not concentrate and realize to the end what he was thinking and experiencing at that moment. So I replied, cheekily, If your people don't have the brains to think, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do to help. He looked at me as if he were ready to shoot me, feeling that he could do nothing, and instead of answering, threw me a telegram from Admiral Canaris. Very calmly I picked up the message and thanked him. The telegram read, Good work, Admiral Canaris. As I read the telegram, I remembered how, as I passed a group of low-ranking officers chatting with each other and completely ignoring me, I heard them discussing us without even bothering to lower their voices. Then one of them said the following in a deliberately loud voice. This time Germany recruited an entire kindergarten.
The end of the sentence was covered by the laughter of the others. I wanted to turn around and send them away, but they were senior in rank, and all I could do was clench my teeth and silently go on my way. But today was the hour when I felt satisfied. I did not care at all that now they would be tried by a military court, because for failure to complete the task any of us could be shot. Now those very kindergarten boys had shown that they could work, maybe even better than more experienced officers. After all, we hadn't been lazing around all this time, but practicing under the most brutal conditions. The Brigadier General's voice interrupted my thought. If I had the power, I would put most of you on trial for insolence, disobedience and violation of instructions. But fortunately for you, you are not under my command. I don't know what your job is and I'm not particularly interested. I have orders to provide you with 12 barges, 6 rocket launchers, 12 assault guns, 6 88 caliber cannons, and 6 troop transports, plus a staff car. I grinned, ignoring the general's words. It meant that we were finally being sent into real combat, and so there would certainly be no academies now. I politely asked when we would get all the equipment. Hmm, today, he replied curtly, and I hope you won't catch my eye again. Everyone who was in the headquarters was disbanded. None of the senior officers did not speak to me, but from outside I did not hear a single swear word against me, even if there were any, they were said quietly, jubilant with all my soul. I rushed to the barracks and found the whole group waiting for me. They were as happy as children who had stolen apples from the orchard, and when they saw me they literally pounced with questions. There was no formality between us. I was their superior only because I was assigned to them. In reality, we were all equals, and so we didn't bother each other with things like saluting and speaking in a commanding tone. I think it's definitely time to see the real war for yourself now, I announced jubilantly. Now listen up, every last one of you. Assault weapons and all other combat equipment that is intended for us, I would like to take today. We need to set everything up in front of the barracks entrance and put it on alert. It is necessary that our actions look professional, and that no one will turn their tongue to call us a kindergarten. These last words I said with pride. As I was walking around the barracks and had already reached the halfway point, I saw Willie running in. Hey, Jord, you got the best car, he shouted. It can go over the most difficult parts of the road. It can swim. You can even drive it over the railroad tracks. I think it can jump over ditches too. But most importantly, Jorg, he blushed. She belongs to you and me. I ignored his last remark, and then he continued. And let's go to Pillow by car. We passed our driving test so we can do it safely. This idea appealed to me very much, and we went out to have a look at it. On the doors were painted split vases, the hallmarks of a military unit. This meant that we were independent, being under our own command and under the supreme command. At the same time, the car displayed the headquarters flag. Willie hoped to get in the driver's seat, and I agreed. As soon as we arrived in Pillow, Willie dragged me straight to the hotel. Not knowing that the hotel was owned by his aunt and uncle, I looked at him questioningly. The place looked more like a tavern than a hotel, and when we sat down at one of the available tables, Willie looked around, shining like the shiny stars on his epaulettes. A girl of about eighteen came up to us and politely asked what we were going to order. Willie just smirked, not even dignifying her with an answer. Then he glared at her and she blushed, not recognizing him as her cousin. After Willie, minding every word, said the following. If you don't know how to do your job properly, then go and tell your mother to come. I looked at him in disgust, not understanding the rationale behind his behavior. The girl practically ran out of the room, and a few moments later a full-figured, pleasant-looking woman appeared. Her mouth opened in amazement, and she cried out loud, Willie. She literally snatched him from his chair and pounced on him, kissing him, repeating the same thing all the time. Willie, 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 my God. You become a real man. That's why your sister didn't recognize you. I felt embarrassed. Then Willie introduced me, and for a moment I thought his aunt was going to hug me, but instead she took our hands and led us into the kitchen. You boys must have been starving. I can't even look at you, your skin and bones. She put food on the table until there was no more room. But most importantly, all the food was home cooked, and for the last three long years we had not eaten anything tasty. In Germany it is not customary to ask anyone what they did, what they were doing, and so Aunt Willie asked us no questions. Putting the can of beer on the table, she simply swore. Now even the beer isn't what it used to be. 
but I've found something better for you. I hope you like it. Willie had been drinking beer since he was a kid, which couldn't be said for me. I didn't like its bitter taste and only drank one glass, leaving the rest to Willie. When we left, his aunt was almost sobbing and demanded that he come back soon and with me. Before we arrived, the girl came out again, and her mother explained to her who Willie was. It was only three years ago that you were playing together, and you should be ashamed that you didn't even recognize your cousin. She wagged her finger at all three of us. How quickly you grow up. We said our goodbyes and left. On the way back to camp, Willie broke all the rules of the road, but there was no trouble. The entire armory was lined up in front of the barracks, and the boys were cleaning and rubbing the guns to a shine. Fuchias came up to me. Well, Jorg, those idiots at headquarters, he said, took two hours to find out where you were. I told them you went to check out the new car, so they had nothing to say. Willie offered me a ride, and I got in the car looking like a general. We pulled up and one of the guards flew up and opened the door. Getting out, I calmly made my way toward headquarters. Hearing the bellowing, I immediately realized that it was the voice of the brigadier general. Damn you. He bellowed. Now there will be no peace here. The tanks are filled with fuel. The ammunition is packed. The troops are ready to leave and I have no idea where you might be. He looked at me with furious eyes. There are maneuvers in East Prussia and not only there, but everywhere. That is why I have been given the order to collect you and transport you to Pojigen, where you will report your arrival to the commander of the SS Armored Division in Grasdusland. Whose orders? I asked the question. An order from the Fuhrer from the Rees Chancellery. Are we leaving by train? No, he yelled again. All the trains are overloaded with soldiers. You'll have to make your own way. He handed me a paper and I read it. You will cross the Russian border and report there to the commander of the Grossdutzland Division. This is their location. June 17, 1941. Admiral Canaris. Pojigern was 80 miles from Pillow, and we had to get there by our own means. Each unit had a field kitchen and its own means of transportation, and we were ordered to set out immediately. Running over to the boys, I told them all about it, which surprised them very much. Nevertheless, within an hour, everyone was absolutely ready. Although I was trying not to think, still the same thought was drilling in my brain. If it's the academy again, another school, I'll die. I was still in a reverie when Willie appeared and told me that the group was assembled and ready to march. We went outside with him. The sight that opened up to us was impressive. The long barrels of the cannons, mounted at an angle of 50 degrees, were set up to repel any attack. Everything had been perfected, and the polished metal gleamed in the sun. Will you ride in the car at the head of the squad? Will he asked? No. I'm thinking of climbing up on the cannon in front. When we ride out through the gate, I'll square my shoulders proudly, and you can be sure those old turkeys will remember me just like that. We moved slowly. Heavy artillery was not to be transported at speeds higher than 30 kilometers per hour, and we were given orders to keep to the edge of the road so that other vehicles could move freely. The first day we traveled only 50 miles and at night we entered a pine forest and camped there. Pine smell, clean air. And no one there could punch us in the nose and insult us by pointing out that even rats think better than we do. We had no tents or mattresses, but we had sleeping bags and for the first time we slept in the open air. Only the owls disturbed us with their hooting and the guards walking in a circle and talking among themselves. We were simple soldiers now, and that was how I imagined military life to be. By seven o'clock the next morning, we were on the road again. At noon, we passed my house, but we did not stop. At every part of the way, we met people gawking at us. Never before had they seen so many troops as they had seen in the last few days. We were but one troop out of a vast number of them. Men working in the fields raised their heads and looked at us, and women took their children in their arms and pointed their hands toward the guns, looking more and more closely. I tried to see anyone I knew in the crowd, but saw no one. On the other side of the river, we were stopped by military police guarding the area surrounding the field. Each of the patrolmen had a dog on a chain. They sternly asked who the commander of the unit was. Willie leaned out of the car, pointing at me, and as they headed in my direction, I had to get down from my gun. We had removed all identifying marks from our uniforms, and so seeing the empty tunic, the older of the policemen looked at me with an expressionless look. Hmm. Keep up the good work, I said in a gruff tone. They looked at each other, 
and elbowing each other, explained that they were here to give us directions to Gross Deutschland headquarters. I was curious as to what we had in common with the SS. Although they too served Hitler, the purpose of their training was quite different from ours. They were taught, when facing the enemy, to go to the end without surrendering. Death for the motherland was their motto. And while we represented the classified troops, they, on the contrary, were the face of the German army, an example for the rest of us to follow. I respected them, but at the same time I disliked them. We followed the military police soldiers along a narrow path, but instead of stopping in Pogigen, as we had expected, they led us straight to the border area. I felt like some kind of deserter until I realized where we were going. By the time we entered the forest, which was three miles from the border, I was getting worried. Along the way we saw hundreds of tanks, heavy armed artillery, and millions of infantrymen, and the question on my mind had two answers. Either we were attacking Russia or defending ourselves against it. The air was guarded by patrol planes. We were just boys, and the excitement and anticipation of something new almost made us lose our heads. I saw Willie sitting in the front seat of the car. His head was spinning in all directions, so that it looked as if it would fall off a little more. And all the other guys were acting the same way. The main divisional headquarters was located in a house in the woods, and in fact it had everything we needed, including telephone, radio and radar. Two messengers rode out on motorcycles to meet us and led the way to an open area. It took us quite a while to arrange the equipment and set up the guns, and only then did the Hauptsturmführer's car appear. One of the boys went up to him and saluted. He laughed in return. Welcome to the division, hmm? he said. I have a special order for you. I am waiting for the squad leaders at the headquarters. Really gathered all the seniors together. We got into one of the waiting cars and followed the brigadier general's car. At the headquarters, everyone in the office was ordered to leave the room. An SS patrol was making the rounds around the building and only the SS officers, the general himself and us remained in the room. Then the secret meeting began and no one here told us off as if we were newcomers. They were perfectly informed about the school we had gone through and how prepared we were. Before revealing all the plans, the general addressed the officers, saying that if a single living soul outside this room learned of the conversation that was taking place here, everyone present would be punished with death for divulging a military secret. Only then did the secret meeting begin. First, a large bag containing photographic images retaken from maps was placed in front of us, and then a box with a small screen inside was placed. Hmm. It is time to fight the enemy, an SS officer told us, and of course you have taken the oath. On Sunday, June 22, at four o'clock in the morning, all the guns of Germany will be pointed at Russia. At the moment, only the supreme leadership and you and I are aware of this. All other generals will be informed in the next 24 hours. For now, everyone believes that major maneuvers are taking place, and this is the only way to mislead our enemy. But we're not here to talk about war against Russia. You and I have a slightly different agenda. Our intelligence has reported that on the Latvian border, 15 kilometers from here. The Russians have amassed numerous troops, bunkers, artillery. Perhaps they are preparing to repel an attack. That's why I'm here. And that's also why the entire 115th is here. If Russia gets ahead of us in its actions and manages to strengthen its defenses, many of our countrymen will be lost. So listen very carefully. Three squads of the 115th Division will be parachuted into their territory at exactly midnight Saturday through Sunday. They destroy communication in the whole territory from the border and Toro Ganado, the main headquarters located in Siaudiai. But the main task is to break communication with Moscow. Now you and I will watch movies of the location of the defensive forces. He turned to the Brigadier General. The unit itself will not engage the enemy directly. It has taken years to train these young men in everything they know how to do. But even so, we cannot be sure of absolute success. So when the direct fighting begins, keep them as far away from the line of fire as possible. We were then joined by other SS officers, and as the windows were draped with dark curtains, we began to be shown a movie. First we saw the road leading from the border to Taurogan, along which were telephone lines, special attention being paid to the wires marked in red. These cables stretched and stretched for long distances. This footage, if necessary, will be shown to you a hundred times. It refers to the men under the command of Captain von Conroth, the SS officer explained to us. We will study this plot thoroughly. 
This preemptive action must be carried out, as previously discussed, with the captain and the brigadier general. I did not hold back a smile. These Secret Service guys were usually not ceremonious with anyone. They put themselves above all generals and even the Lord God himself. Suddenly the picture changed, and we saw a bridge over a river, with steel pipes stretching along it. On the right side of the river rose a hill, on the very top stood a church with a high bell tower, built of red brick. This is the main communications centre. From here, the signals spread automatically. Now look to your left hand on the road. You see an old Lithuanian castle which now houses the headquarters of the Red Army. These two places and the pipes along the bridge should be destroyed first thing in the morning at four o'clock. If possible, do it at three. Watch carefully and memorize everything. At the end of the movie, the curtains on the windows were opened again and a senior SS officer pointed his finger at me. No. Captain von Conroth, what did you see at the beginning? Um, zigzag dug trenches six meters deep. We were also shown a road with telegraph poles along it and a red colored cable stretched between them. What else? In front of the bridge, on the right bank of the river, there is a building materials factory, a pipeline and a dam on the left. There is a church on the hill to the right, and then again on the left, a castle. That's fine, replied the older man. Then he continued looking at the brigadier general. You understand what all this means. These boys have had a long apprenticeship. I mean that the life of each of them is worth more than an entire regiment of the regular army. The brigadier general nodded. Marvellous. I didn't even notice the water dam in the mill. Marvellous, marvellous, he muttered. The brigadier general looked at us with great respect, and our leader explained to him that we had been trained to notice even more insignificant objects. The windows were shaded again, and now we could see Torogin itself. There were four main roads running from the town. One led southwest toward the bridge to the border, and then to Pojigin. Another led northeast to Riga. The third went west, and the fourth went east. When the aerial footage was shown, I could clearly see the trenches along the entire edge of the forest, which was crossed by the road leading to Riga. The shelters stretched for a distance of three to four miles, and everywhere were mounted guns, heavy artillery pieces put on alert. Machine guns seemed to be stationed everywhere. The next story showed again a road that I immediately assumed might lead through the town straight to the border. To the north, towards Sioliai, red lines of cables could be seen, and telegraph poles were clearly visible. After two and a half kilometers from Torrigan, just before reaching the forest, the road diverged in three directions. One signpost read Riga, 250 kilometers, another led to the east and the third to the west. Like all other roads in the locality, these three roads were covered with gravel and each of them disappeared into the forest, which from afar resembled a crescent moon. Further on, everything repeated itself as on the previous occasion. As soon as the curtains were opened, the SS officers pelted me with questions. Once again, I had missed nothing. That's right, said the senior officer. These films will be shown here in the divisional headquarters, with the permission of the brigadier general, until everyone has a perfect grasp of the information. Of course, the brigadier general said a little carelessly, but in fact no answer was needed as he was not asked, but simply put before the fact. Turning to the commanders with whom we had originally entered the office, I asked them to select the best men and gather them into three squads, and then immediately returned to headquarters. Ten minutes passed. The brigadier became increasingly friendly and even offered to take a small drink. Taking out a bottle of wine from his stock, he filled glasses and made a toast to the secret services and to Willie and me. We didn't refuse to finally secure our right to be called real men. We must have looked very young, but we were already as smart as grown men and not just men, but very suspicious and cautious. We drank the bottle in silence and waited. The commanders returned, bringing with them three squads, and stuffed in a small office like herrings in a barrel, we again began to watch the movie. Once and again and again, and again we watched the same shots until each of us could draw a map in the darkness. So firmly had what we had seen settled in our brains. By the time we watched the footage for the last time, each of us felt as if we had spent our entire previous lives in those very places. We now knew every street by sight, every alley we could find with our eyes closed. We were bombarded with questions, and now even the SS officers themselves had no doubts about our success. Then their senior officer took out an envelope and handed it to me. 
I tore off the wax seal and noticed the Brigadier General watching my actions intent. All the others immediately tried to hide their curiosity, pretending that they were busy with something else and were not interested in anything else. I read the letter carefully several times until I was sure I had memorized every word. Passwords, names, places, regiments, units, battalions, detachments, artillery schools, and whatever else the Russians had. Then I took out a match and burned it. That way no one present knew what the letter said, and burning it was the best way to destroy it. The message ended like this. All eyes are on you and the Fuhrer is looking forward to hearing about your success. Admiral Canaris. As the burnt sheet of paper turned to ashes, the senior officer spoke up. Tomorrow, if necessary, all day and maybe even night you will practice parachute jumps. And you will jump not from a tower, but from an airplane. We had nothing to reply to this as we had not had such practice before. We were given Russian uniforms and Russian rifles and pistols. We were also given dry fish, sugar and dried black bread. Red. Those who smoked were given Russian makorka wrapped in Russian newspaper. Then each of us received photos of our loved ones, a girl, parents, being in the garden or in the yard of their house. And finally, we were given our documents confirming that we were soldiers of the Red Army. The commanders of the units transferred three squads under our and Willie's responsibility, and we went to the place where we were to practice our night jumps. I mean, everything was strange and unusual. Everything was perfected and worked like the world's most accurate clock. We all took with us documents certifying that we were Russian soldiers, photographs and uniforms and packed it all in backpacks. Three large transport planes with pilots on board, who had absolutely no idea of the upcoming mission, were already waiting for us. We were briefed, parachutes were fastened on our backs, and we were given the command to start the mission. Nothing was required of us except to simply jump out of the airplane. We were thrown out onto a field, and after landing, we still ran 50 meters with the parachute waving behind us. This activity was no more difficult than jumping off a roof, and everyone was unharmed without a scratch. We handled the task with complete success, and the leadership decided that a second attempt would be a waste of time and gasoline. At the airbase, one of the barracks was prepared especially for us. The men guarding the barracks, after showing us our rooms, immediately left the premises and we were left alone in a building with nothing within a radius of 30 meters around us. Nevertheless, our barracks was not to be overlooked. The whole building was surrounded and we were, in effect, imprisoned prisoners. The next night we were to land secretly in enemy territory. That night all German industry was completing the last preparations for war. There was no sleep in our barracks. Officers were scurrying about the corridors, preparing food supplies, food as much food as possible, like prisoners in their cells. It was as if we were awaiting the sentence to be passed on Saturday at exactly half past twelve. Then, stuffed to the limit with explosives and dressed in the uniforms of Russian soldiers, we moved to the takeoff field. This time security officers accompanied us on the flight. At ten to four we were to land. From that moment on, a new countdown was coming. As our airplane left the ground, I got a hiccup under my spine with excitement. These places must be wiped off the face of the earth first, even before the rumble and roar of German guns everywhere. In the airplane we took the same seats as the day before, and it remained only to wait for the jump. After gaining altitude, the airplanes headed east and crossed the Latvian border. The vastness of the Russian territory opened up to our view. We were instructed, showing on a movie the place of our landing. Courage was required, as here we could be spotted by the Russian military. The red lights flashed. That meant command, get ready. Then one of the officers opened the door and the green light came on. One by one we began to jump out. Dangling in the air, I pondered, if we were spotted by the Russians, we would be captured immediately. This thought did not appeal to me at all because, even in case of supernatural resistance of our three squads, the Red Army fighters would surely be more united and several times outnumber us. But what worried me the most was that all the grueling training might go to waste. I landed safely on the soft grass quickly rolled up and stowed my parachute. I had to orient myself on the terrain to find the agreed rendezvous point. When I got there, half of the group was already waiting for the others. There was peace and quiet all around. We buried our parachutes, and then, looking absolutely no different from real Red Army soldiers, we marched in formation toward the main road. As we got closer, we sang. My stepping on the road Rigus Iuliae, we went forward and the second detachment moved in the opposite direction, singing another song. 
Even the Russian paramilitary guards did not dare to stop the group marching and singing songs at the top of their voices. Especially we were not alone. Somewhere not far away we could hear songs sung by real Russians, marching in whole squads in different directions. The guys from the Secret Service told us that now many units were thrown to strengthen the border, and that's why we met so many soldiers. As soon as our march began, the singing not only gave us courage, but somehow made us automatically reincarnate as Russians, and we had no trouble at all behaving as we had been trained. Moving from the north to Tarragon, kilometer after kilometer we sang more and more new songs known by such names as Three Tankers and Katyusha. As we approached the hills, we saw the very bridge. This was the real test. If they wanted to stop us, it would happen now. The Russians had posts posted on the opposite side of the bridge and inwardly I was already tuning up for a fight, but they only greeted us and we passed by unimpeded. It was a climax. We were in the uniforms of the border guards, one of the best branches of the Russian army. I also saluted back and we crossed the bridge. It was half past three. We continued our march down the road toward the German border, which was a kilometre away. We didn't just look like Russians, we were the real Russians, so that not even a shadow of doubt could creep into the heads of our opponents. There was a note of jubilation in our singing now. Willie led one of the detachments toward the old Lithuanian castle, where the headquarters of the Russian army were located, while I led the others back to the bridge. Pretending to lay the telephone cable, we meanwhile gradually uncoiled it. We were also required to de-energize the old church and bell tower, the main source of communication, and half the boys were already at it. One Russian guarding the site loudly remarked, Oh gee, daddy, T.A., I'd rather sleep now than stand here like a stump or unwind wires. Better yet, get into bed with a woman and take a bottle of vodka with you, said another. The Russians were laughing so loudly that they could be heard on the other side of the river. Meanwhile, we were doing our job quite calmly and openly, digging into the telephone wires and mining the bridge right under their noses. It turned out to be to some extent easier than in the Reich Chancellery, which Admiral Canaris could not have imagined. The whole happening resembled some kind of child's play. After a while, Willie ran up to me and said, Their control centre is completely booby-trapped. Then one by one, the other guys came up and reported that the bridge and pipes were so laden with explosives that anyone who wanted to walk across it afterward would have to pick it up piece by piece, starting from the centre of town. Willie chuckled, and we all laughed too. A small detachment of Russian soldiers approached the bridge, following each other. It turned out to be the Coast Guard, and as they passed us, the senior political officer saluted me. Turning around, they followed in the opposite direction, back where they had come from, and again I was having fun because I was already anticipating the result of our next secret operations. Even Willie didn't know yet about the upcoming plans. At walking in formation, we returned to Tarogan. We were required to keep an eye on the field fuel depots a little to the south. There was also a slaughterhouse nearby, where we were to be turned into labourers at the appointed hour. I looked at my watch. It showed eight to four in the morning. What if something went wrong? If the explosive device didn't work? I continued walking outwardly perfectly calm, inwardly going crazy with questions popping into my head and listening carefully to what was going on around me. And then suddenly I heard an explosion. It shook the air and was followed by others, but not so powerful. The bridge, the church and the castle were gone. I left one of my guys to watch the results of our actions, giving him a capsule of poison in case he was caught by the Russians. We approached the warehouses, seven minutes to four. Oh, changing of the guard, I shouted. The squad stopped. The Russians guarding the fuel joined our ranks and ours took their place. In the guard room of the meatpacking plant, which was quite near, there were, surprisingly, only six men. Just beyond it was another small house. When I reached it, I again commanded change of guard, and again their military men were replaced by ours. As yet, I did not know what to do with them. They were only in the way and completely unnecessary, but I they inspired absolutely no apprehension for they suspected nothing. We could now see what was going on at the railroad station. Not hurriedly marching, we sang Katyusha and scrutinized the territory. All the platforms and in general the whole station was packed with military men, so it made no sense to try to do anything here. Nevertheless, the station's guards did not pose any particular danger. The main object for us here was the railway bridge, which was two kilometers away, stretching towards the German border. 
it as well as another bridge, located three kilometers to the east, crossed the river. Our heavy artillery was to be ferried across it by train, so it had to remain unharmed at all costs. It was beginning to get light. It was already four o'clock. The rumble of thousands of guns came from the German side. Just at that time, tanks and other military equipment, accompanied by our infantry, were crossing the border. The Russians did not realize that an attack on them had begun. They, letting their horses run at full speed, galloped around the station, trying to determine what was going on after all. There was an atmosphere of utter chaos all around. In the midst of this turmoil, no one cared about us, and we quietly continued on our way toward the railroad bridge. On my right side, I could see the bridge already destroyed by us. Everything around it was in smoke, but I still managed to see flames licking the ruins of what had been a castle a few minutes ago. Now squad by squad, the Russian soldiers were trying to establish communication, but it would take them hours to do so, and it would take years to get communication back. They had no hope of changing anything, and we continued our march without worrying about anything. Then, halfway to the bridge, I saw the bunkers. Three of them stood almost abreast of each other, and each contained three machine guns. If they belonged to the Russians, it meant that we would not reach the bridge and could hardly do anything. Why were they on the right side of the road? My brain was working feverishly. The bunkers looked like two-story houses, just fantastic in their fortress-like appearance. But strangely enough, I saw no one inside or nearby. Immediately turning right, we openly headed towards them. To our relief as we got closer, we saw that the machine guns were unloaded and totally unready for combat, although pointed toward the German border. I thanked God that I had had another detachment with me, 30 of the best fighters capable of much. But now that the Russians were marching among us, it was simply impossible to do anything about it. In order not to be under suspicion, I, trying to speak ambiguously, gave orders to the first squad to stand guard at the bunkers and no matter what happens, do not leave their posts. Then added ambiguous, if anything, shoot without warning. My men understood everything perfectly well, and so did the Russians, only in a different sense. The detachment was divided into three parts and each ten men took a bunker under their guard. With the rest, eight of whom were Russians, I continued on my way to the bridge, frightened. They asked me, Hmm, so where are the Germans? Of course, are driving them back. I replied nonchalantly, The Russians are entering Germany now. These words gave them courage. Then I ordered twenty men, ten of my own and ten Russians, to burrow into the ground a hundred meters from the bridge on the German side. We did not go any farther. We had road shovels with us. But of my ten men, I put five men on each side of the bridge to guard it. The boys on the other side had been digging furiously, and so were now here. They had set up two machine guns requisitioned from the guards on the bridge, and that was all we could do. The squad in the bunkers opened fire on the advancing battalion of Russians who were trying to get close to the bridge unnoticed. Leaving Willie in charge, I trotted toward the bunkers. The Russian bullets rained down like sand and to try to reach the nearest bunker and avoid death. I had to run or crawl. Thus, sneaking along the riverbank, I reached the nearest bunker at my last breath. When I got to my own, the first person I met was Oberfeenried Kruger, who was thrashing about, unable to find a place. He told me that a whole battalion of Russians was ready to attack the bunkers, but no one from the squad was going to give up so easily. We started digging a trench. It leads to the fourth bunker and the Russians were crawling in from all sides like ants. Now the only way they can get to us is underground, he added. But the other passages are still open, aren't they? I asked worriedly. Of course, and we have a telephone connection. The telephone wires run through the tunnels. We should have a restroom here, and it would be as good as a good hotel. Unfortunately, the cannons outside, although they were pointed at the German border, could not help us at all to repel the battalion's attack. Still, there were four machine guns here in the rear, so we could fight off the Russians for quite a while. Hmm. How are we with ammunition? I asked. Nuttier guns, answered Kruger. Enough to hold out here for a month. No, thank God, I said. The next moment he grabbed me by the shoulder and dragged me out the door. Before we knew it, we were under fire. Now we were in a real war. We may have lacked experience in practical warfare, but in theory we had no equal. The Russians kept firing, but we were deep in the bunkers, and they couldn't hurt us if they wanted to. They might bring in a tank to try to do some damage to the bunkers, and I grinned, 
thinking of the annoyance the enemy must feel at having their main stronghold now turned against themselves. Satisfied with the situation in the first bunker, I followed the underground tunnel to the second. Following the lighted area, I came upon Fenrich Linz. If everything is under control, he reported to me. But there are more Russians outside than one can meet on Moscow streets. It will not last long. I assured him. The main thing is not to let them get close to the bridge. The third bunker, closest to the bridge and visible from the other side of the river, was more convenient for us than all the others. The guns mounted there were placed at three different angles, and we could use them against the Russians advancing from the border and thus cover our detachment on the bridge. The guns also protected the road turning right and leading south. Luck was on our side. The Russians had now thrown all their available forces at the bridge, so the boys there needed all the help they could get. I had no way of knowing what was going on with the Russians trying to break through the defences, but I could see that our ranks were holding so far as they were returning fire to fire on both sides of the bridge. Five o'clock. A new day greeted the dawn with the smell of gunpowder and tongues of flame. The Russians had brought six T-36 tanks from Tarragon and stopped them in front of the middle bunker. The closest of them to Tarragon tried to destroy the bunker, but this activity could be compared to throwing stones at a brick wall. The guys in the bunker had been working hard. During the last hour they had dismantled the anti-tank guns and one of the machine guns. They had put heavier rigs in their place, thus securing their rear. By the time I reached there they were ready for battle. Fenrich Hans, after the first machine gun burst, ran up and hugged me joyfully. Perhaps this reaction was not quite typical of a military environment, but it didn't matter to me. The first shots proved fatal for the Russian tank. For a moment everything went silent. The Russians were leaving their positions. Apparently they were in trouble. We sat tensely looking, listening and waiting for something. About five minutes passed and then the firing started again, but from another corner. This was their biggest mistake. The bunker closest to the bridge now held them under fire, and now two extra-long howitzers were firing from there. First a smoke screen, then an anti-tank attack, and we forced the Russians into another retreat. Everything happened lightning fast. Six hours. Because of the fire and smoke I could no longer see the bridge, and it was hard to imagine whether our unit was still holding on there. The Russians had completely surrounded the bunkers, and we continued to direct their main hope at them. To myself I thought, I wish the day would come soon when Admiral Canaris would hear about this. Suddenly one of the boys ran up to me and shout, You just go look at this. I rushed with him to the observation post. A huge six-ton tank was rolling right at us, and it was at such an angle that the barrels of our guns could not fight back, and its muzzles were already raised, so I immediately shouted to the others. Quickly descend into the tunnel and move to the other bunkers. It's like a giant dragon. The tank stopped in front of a bunker and struck it. Whole tons of phosphoric light fell on the bunker, and I saw that everything around it was on fire. Then the ammunition began to explode, and from our position in the first bunker we could see the plaster crumbling from the walls. The dust and soot made us black as if we were Negroes, and only our eyes stood out on our faces. For a moment it might have seemed that our situation was getting worse, but it was not. Because we had anti-tank weapons pointed directly at the Russians, and they knew perfectly well that if they did anything, we would respond by wiping them off the face of the earth. They tried again to intensify the firing, but this attempt again failed. Inside the two bunkers it was hell. It was cool outside, but we felt as if we were in a furnace. Surprisingly enough, Willie and the others were somehow miraculously still on the bridge. The smoke had cleared a little, and I could see that the fire was still burning. We had no communication with them as they were completely cut off from us, but we had an imposing appearance because of our guns and could support them in case of another attack. The Russians were still in confusion, not realising how the German army had already managed to advance such a distance. I think they would not believe it if they knew they were fighting only two squads of 18-year-old boys. But just by this point we were exhausted and almost defeated. Only the excitement and determination to succeed kept us going. My brains were foggy and I did not know how this battle could end. Was the German army moving in our direction or retreating back? I realised that we would not last long, and if ours were forced to retreat, we would definitely lose. There was no water at all in the bunkers, and what we had brought with us in flasks was finished an hour ago. Besides, it was getting stuffy from the dust and hotter. I looked at my watch. It was fifteen to eight. 
and then it was as if a miracle had happened. I heard the first Bate strike. I knew, I knew for sure what it meant. It was ours, and I knew from what distance the gunfire was coming. There was no doubt. Our vast armed army was not more than three kilometers away. Thank God, I said loudly, and taking a rocket launcher, fired three green salvos. It meant, come in, the road is open. The whole situation is under control. Then I explained everything to the guys. Three kilometers from here. Nurse, shouted the soldiers with black faces. That means they'll be here in ten minutes. Nurse to sure, I assured them. The Russians were retreating from the border in long columns, like cows going to the slaughterhouse. But our persistent fighters were not going to leave us to our fate. They had destroyed one bunker and were now close to destroying the other two and finishing off the bridge. The realization that the Germans were very close strengthened our hope that we would survive. A completely alien and unfamiliar detachment, we now took almost a kindred spirit, as we never would have done before. Shot after shot, we made ourselves known twice. I was in the far bunker trying to keep track of the enemy's reaction when one of the boys rushed in from the third bunker nearest the bridge and barely catching his breath. Rep the retreating enemy, rallying from the last of their strengths, are driving up trains of military equipment to try to make a breakthrough, and this is happening only a kilometer from here. All right, we start firing, but we must try not to damage the transmission line, I said quickly. The big moment had arrived. For the first time, the Russians were facing our guns, and we had a real chance to show what we could do. In the third bunker, we lined up the machine guns and opened fire. Almost immediately, the guns in the neighboring bunkers responded. But these actions blocked the railroad tracks and consequently prevented our Bertha rushing to our aid, so I gave the order to reduce the fire and only shoot back if necessary, but on no account fire on the railroad. Guys, don't let them hold on as a group. Make them crash. I shouted. I Caught in the crossfire, the Russians were finally confused, and jumping off the train on the move, ran scattering. We accomplished our task. Nevertheless, the attacks from Torogan did not become weaker. The bombardment and shelling continued with every weapon the enemy had, though it was all to no avail. That armor they had built themselves was better for us than even they could have imagined. The only thing that could really hurt us was their huge tank. We really couldn't cope with it. Looking through binoculars, I saw a crane working on the railroad, lifting and placing car after car on the track. Everything was happening so fast that by nine o'clock Big Bertha had already been rolled across the bridge, and our first mission was considered accomplished, but I felt too tired to react in any way. So looking like chimney sweeps, we barely dragging our feet, moved towards our own, but we were ignored by absolutely everyone. They were only interested in the enemy, crossing the bridge. I met the divisional colonel, who frightened me at the first moment, pushing me and knocking me down. If it hadn't been for you commanding those bunkers, he shouted angrily, we might have been able to surround them. We couldn't get the armament over those rutted roads that run all over the place, and you made it worse. You and your squad have already made a mark in this war. Congratulations. I wasn't really listening to him. All I was interested in right now was Willie's whereabouts and what had happened to the rest of the guys. So as fast as I could, ignoring the colonel's words, I rushed out to find them. The first one I managed to find was Willie. He was smiling, and there was a bleeding wound on his head. That's in the after efforts of the blast. Because of those damn Russians, I lost half an ear. He shouted as I ran up to him. If I hadn't ducked my nose into the ground in time, I would have lost my head. But now my lungs are full of dust. How many men have you lost? I asked quietly. You'd be surprised but they're all alive. His smile grew even wider. One was wounded in the arm, another was shot through the lung. That's all. The only valuable loss is my ear. But about the Russians? He laughed, showing his white teeth. Oh, all the time they kept near us, but we didn't actually see them. The woods around here are full of them, and they were constantly trying to launch new attacks. Twice we answered them with equally heavy fire. An SS colonel who had joined us pronounced, Hey, they deserve to be free men, but in no way prisoners of war. Indeed they are, added Willie. They want to fight on our side. Until we returned fire, they had no idea we were Germans. But they're not badly prepared to fight. The colonel shook his head in confusion. Well, there may be some people among the Bolsheviks, too. When the trucks were brought up for us to return to the group, 
the Russians who remained in our detachment we took with us. On the way, I asked the Russian sergeant what he thought of the situation where we had impersonated Russians, and he said, smart, you can't say anything. If even a slight doubt had crept into my head, I would never have accepted the change of guard. Then he added harshly, and in general, who would argue with the border guards? They can whip us with a whip if anyone asks stupid questions. The fact that you were wearing our uniform was enough. I slept most of the way back, not caring that we were travelling on the same roads we had flown over the previous night. I felt almost nuth. No tension, no anxiety. Everything was indifferent, except that we were returning to a place where we could eat, sleep, and rest humanly. The trip lasted only four hours, and by three o'clock we had reached headquarters. The Russians were gathered together and sent to Germany, where they were to join the new Russian army under the command of General Vlasov. The well-deserved rest we had expected did not take place. A brigadier general arrived at headquarters from the Latvian border, and the noise raised by his men manoeuvring the trucks, the clang of the machine guns with which they were loaded, could revive even a dead man. Besides, our third detachment had still not returned, and we were worried sick to our stomachs. If they mingled with the retreating Russians, they had little chance. Twenty-four hours passed, and I began to lose the last hope of their return. The next morning those who remained returned. The senior officer came up to me and reported his arrival, as the regulations required. But I was not at all interested in what he had to say. How many of you went back? I asked quietly. He looked past me with a blank stare. Nothing, see. Without hiding the bitterness in his voice, I recognised what had happened to the others, and he said, without murdered. Then, enunciating the word slowly, he continued, As you know, we fought back to the last man. But what can thirty men do against thousands? We tried to hold on as best we could, but their tanks were inexorably closing in on us. In the end they just crushed us all to smithereens. What else happened? I asked in a hoarse voice. We destroyed most of the weapons depots in the forests without a hitch, and we cut the cables to the army headquarters, and we also took out the Torrigan guards. Uh, right, you'd better lie down to rest now. As soon as he left, I went down to the radio room, and, overcoming the pain in my stomach, sent a lightning telegram to the Rish Chancellery. Casualties amounted to twenty-three men. The mission was successfully accomplished. Afterward I wandered for an hour or two where not long ago they had lived, by the machines they had used. Perhaps that's to be expected in war. We were trained for it, but these guys didn't even have time to be young. It was long past noon, and the rumble of the guns, in the distance, still shook the air.